Hello, my name is Jim Vieira. I'm a stonemason, uh, writer, researcher, and lecturer. Uh, like Rona said, about 20 years ago, I started to find odd stone structures in the woods, and it really um, piqued my interest, and I tried to figure out what it meant, because it didn't, they didn't fit the colonial context. So, I, um, my normal presentations are several hours with hundreds of slides. I will do my best to give you a uh, taste of what I've been researching for about 20 years. I've written a series of articles for Ancient American Magazine. I also write for The Independent here in Shelburne Falls. The gist of what I'm going to talk about is my understanding that what we're told about Ancient America seems to be clearly wrong, that, that there was a racist paradigm created to push Native Americans off the land in the 1800s, led by institutions like the Smithsonian, uh, you know, political and religious motivations. So Native Americans needed to be portrayed as nomadic, savage, disorganized, and unsophisticated. So you could justifiably uh, wreak havoc on them and, and create manifest destiny in the United States. I don't want to go too much into that, but that I have to express that because that is what we have, that is the legacy that we have now with things like this not properly understood. So I will talk about the ancient cultures and their level of sophistication in ancient America. This is a stone carn, I'm sorry, that's a stone chamber oriented to the equinox in Goshen. That is a ceremonial mound with a niche and uh, quartz, one of a dozen in Washington, Mass. Here we have Cahokia. When the colonists showed up, there were over 200,000 earthen pyramids, geometric forms, conical mounds, and effigies of astounding proportions. It was like a geometric blackboard in ancient America. This is at Cahokia, it still exists. These structures are so staggering that people don't even think they exist still. So this is what the colonists encountered. 100 foot high, 14 acre base, that's one acre larger than the Great Pyramid of Giza. 22 million cubic yards of soil taken from over a mile away to build this structure. And it looks like, uh, many researchers think that actually the mound builders, which started 3400 BC in Louisiana, came up from the Yucatan, avoiding the death cults, to create a more harmonious civilization. And you see it has some air marks of a uh, Mesoamerican structure. So instead of stone, which wasn't available, they built with earth. That's a wood hinge right there. A lot of these sites are, are aligned to astronomical events. In Newark, Ohio, we have the most enigmatic earthwork on the planet. Right here, up in the corner, is the octagon and circle, 50 and 20 acres. Its research is lively and horn in the 80s determined that it was a precise lunar calendar. That line right there, that road, is a 55 mile, 189 foot wide, the entire length, several foot high, earthen walled corridor to another site in Chillicothe, Ohio, that is also a lunar calendar, measuring the metonic 18.61 year cycle of the moon. Now, the astronomy that we find is mine, like all around ancient America, from the star cities of the Hopi and Anasazi to uh, the mound builder creations. And um, the Athenian Met Meton in uh, 432 BC was supposed to be the originator and of the Metonic cycle. The mound builders might have beat them to the punch. Right down the, uh, the pipe here, actually you find the 51.84 uh, slope of the Great Pyramid embedded in this earthwork in the azimuth line, and you find a 187 foot grid pattern found at Teotihuacan, Mexico, in the earthworks of ancient America, or a vast number of them. It appears that a common school of mathematics and engineering exists all around the globe, which is a story for another time. So, I, my thought is that the mound builders who built all kinds of structures may have made it into New England and be behind some of the ceremonial stoneworks that we find here. I, you know, I read through the historical text, I, I saw that the mound builders built walls and earthen uh, and stone complexes that are carbon dated. Virtually every other part of the country has earth and stone structures dated thousands of years old, ceremonial structures, but there's a historical blackout because of the paradigm, I believe, in New England. So this is the Goshen Stone Chamber, one of hundreds in New England. Look at the fine work, it's all dry laid. Everything I'll show you here is dry laid. 12 interlocking stones for the roof. Half of these chambers are oriented to the equinox sunrise or winter solstice sunrise. So I went Indiana Jones a couple of years ago, and I'm in the chamber, March 20th, right down the middle. And this, uh, you find this at a lot of chamber sites. And we are told that these are colonial root cellars. And this root cellar has a 10 ton, 10 foot by five foot sailing in New Salem, Massachusetts. That's me for scale, it's over six foot high. As a stonemason, that's quite a feat. 
to get that up there. This is very interesting. Gunji Womp, John Winthrop, founder of Springfield, Massachusetts, 1654, writes to John Winthrop, governor of Connecticut, asking, we just showed up at Pequot, Gunji Womp. We found the stone complex with many strange stone walls and stone huts. Do you know anything about them? And it's strange indeed. Uh, 18, 1988, David Barron, researcher, found that the stone line shaft created in the chamber allows the equinox sunset to come through twice a year and only on those days. So another orientation, plus archaeologist Jim Whittle got many carbon dated results out of this. Let me quickly, um, many of these sites around the country have, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in the Northeast have carbon dates that came out of them. Right here from Geochron Labs, Cambridge, Mass. Uh, 2,995 years uh, pr from the present date was one of the carbon dates that came, that came back. Har uh, Harold W. Kruger, Technical Director, Geochron Labs. The paradigm doesn't like this, so we're left with root cellars and farmers clearing piles. There are hundreds of these all over the place, thousands, I'm sorry. And as a stonemason, that is not a farmer's clearing pile. That is. But in these sites, in these mounds, or in other parts of the country, and archaeologists uh, acknowledge that they're old, that the Adena, the Hopewell, the Mississippian cultures, native cultures built these things. But in the Northeast, you have a different story. That's the Proly Dolmen in Ireland. And when you get to the United States, that is in North Salem, uh, New York. But it's been transformed into a glacial erratic somehow because it doesn't fit the paradigm. I went to visit this. It's on five points. It's a pretty smart dolmen. And uh, it's really absolutely man-made. But it shows you that it just doesn't fit the paradigm. So it just gets ignored. 1000 BC, Ireland, a national treasure, root cellar in Vermont. <laughs> so the, uh, the colonial astronomers who built this knew their stuff because that's Harvard's Barry Fell right there. Nine 14 foot long, three ton stones for the roof. And Maver and Dick's researchers who wrote Manitou, they determined that the doorway marks the 18.3 uh, and 28.6 declination angles of the moon, the major and minor standstills. It's eclipse predictor, and it lets the winter solstice sunrise come right through the center, just like New Grange, 3000 BC, Ireland. That's ancient English. Uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that Europeans built these structures. What I'm saying is that they exist all around the globe, and you find the same ceremonial structures in New England, but somehow they're colonial remnants where we live. So King's Chamber, New York, massive granite blocks. I visited there's 150 of these chambers in Putnam County, New York. Uh, this is interesting. A, um, somebody who read one of my ancient ar article, American articles uh, sent me these pictures. He found this 25 years ago in the woods. He's a stonemason. He said it plagued his mind. And uh, it's arched. It's all dry laid. Beautiful construction. And as a mason, I, I would imagine I would have to build a false work to create this. It's just, just, just a mind-numbing amount of, um, excuse me, work behind this, and it just doesn't make any sense. So, it gets a little strange here. I ask you to bear with me. I, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, the mound builders had trade routes through New England, and that is known. But I was trying to tie up, I'm saying, are the mound builders to be found in um, New England? Do they make it here? Do they build any of these structures? Do they, you know, what was going on? There's not much known about the uh, history of, of New England, for instance. So we started to read through his historical texts, and I found some strange things. History of Deerfield. This is eminent historian George Sheldon. One of these skeletons, this is on page 78. Monstrous size, head as big as a peck basket with double teeth all around. Examined by Stephen Williams, who said the owner must have been nearly eight feet high. Eight-foot skeleton, double rows of teeth. Like, what the hell is that? And I just felt compelled to dive into the historical texts. So I spent... Countless hours, tens of thousands of pages, and I found similar things. Middleborough Mass, seven, eight, double rows of teeth. Uh, up in Rockingham, Vermont, the jawbone was of such size that a large man could easily slip it over his face, and the teeth, which were all double, were perfect. Double rows of teeth again. Here we go, Martha's Vineyard, seven foot, an unusual feature, a complete double row of teeth in both the upper and lower jaws. So I went to the Pocumtuck Museum. I said, yeah, here you go. Sheldon talks about an eight-foot skeleton with double rows of teeth. Do we know anything about this? He said, oh, here's his archaeological scrapbook. This is my Da Vinci Code moment. I open it up. 
and he has giant skeleton reports pasted in there with mound builder stuff, and Sheldon was basically, you know, in his collaging, saying that it looks like he believed the mound builders were in New England, and they had race of giants uh, interspersed with them. Very, very strange indeed. 1883 catalog of curiosity and relics at the museum shows that an over eight foot skeleton was actually on display there. Parts of it in a giant skeleton from uh, Gill. And I talked to the physical anthropologist who was part of the team who reinterred that for the uh, Native American Repatriation Act. So on display in Deerfield, they had giant skeletons. And it's right at the top, they're over eight foot, or it says at least eight foot. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm trying, you know, I thought I had credibility with all the stuff I was doing. I'm getting into this twilight zone of research, and I'm like, I just have to follow. I'm compelled to report what I find. And I find that there are other researchers who uh, encounter the same thing and have hundreds of reports in their books. Fred Zimmerman, Ross Hamilton, right here, uh, Philip Reif. I'll just read you quickly. Chapter 5 is, of his book is called Anatomic Anomalies. At least some of the giants who once inhabited the United States differ from modern humans in ways other than their tremendous size. Judging from the number, I'm sorry, judging from the number of their remains, they also possess some unique anatomical features. One of these features that keeps cropping up repeatedly in reports of giant skeletons from a variety of geographic areas and time periods. In fact, it seems nearly every giant skull found with its dentition intact includes the same peculiarity, double rows of teeth. So at least I know I'm partially uh, not crazy. So, Abraham Lincoln, the eyes of that extinct species of giant whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as our eyes do now. Abraham Lincoln, 1948. Washington uncovered giant skeletons in 1754, working for the Virginia militia. There are many historical accounts. Honest Abe. New York Times, hundreds, uh, Sci Scientific American, American Antiquarian, New York Times. This was known at the time and then eventually buried. Uh, right here, Judge, I'm sorry, Chief Justice McKean, Judge Bryan, and others found two 11 foot three skeletons. Nine foot out of one of the burial mounds in Wisconsin. 10 foot nine, Wailing, Virginia, the sheriff found it. On and on and on. Wood, uh, Charles Huntington, this is at the Cataragus Museum in New York um, State. He found, when they unearthed these two skeletons, a nine foot male and a seven foot female, took the measurements, the bones crumbled away like many did because they weren't mummified although some bones survived and went to places like the Smithsonian. So he made this, I talked to his granddaughter and uh, she said he was driven to do this by what he saw. I, I should have somebody to pitch it for scale, but that's nine feet tall. Not like, you know, Boston Celtics, six two, nine feet. So Warren K. Moorhead, the Dean of American Archeology span found giant skeleton reports, I mean giant skeletons when he unearthed them all around the country. Tioga Point, uh, Pennsylvania, 68 of them. Over seven foot tall, many much la uh, larger. Many specimens went to the American Investigating Museum and they were stolen. And there's all these reports over and over again. I know, it's pathetic. Uh, skeleton in copper armor, a giant uh, he found in Illinois at Chillicothe, Connecticut. Giant skeleton. Warren K. Moorhead, the Dean of American Archaeology. And I found a curious thing. In the text, secret text of the Freemasons and Rosicrucians, they also talk about this. They have... Right here in my newest article, I have, uh, sorry, I have pictures of skeleton, the skulls of almost 10 foot skeletons. Uh, the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons in their secret texts talked about this and had matter of fact reports from like town histories in the New York Times. And they use it to connect it to the lost continent of Atlantis right in the text. So I'll just, I'll just lay that out there, whatever that means. I know it's a freak show. So the Smithsonian, you know, we're told that it's the, um, you know, the, the height of science and, you know, honestly, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole any further, but, you know, there appears to be a lot of um, misinformation and corruption all around the Smithsonian and what they're doing. Right here in their own reports, seven foot six, there's giant skeleton reports in their ethnology reports. Right here, this front skeleton, over seven foot. That's a Smithsonian burial uh, find, Nelson Mount. Eight foot four, Professor McGee on the, on the left from the Smithsonian. They bought this uh, skeleton $500 from San Diego, took a tissue sample, and it, it's down at the warehouse and uh, not to be seen again. Here we go, thighs and skulls sent to the Smithsonian. Smithsonian Institution to determine the age of the skeleton. Yeah, they might determine it, they're not gonna tell us. So, the David H. Koch 
all of human origins at the Smithsonian. If you, th if you think there's no uh, political or uh, any kind of influence going on, Koch, Koch brothers, billionaires, horrendous um, track record of, of uh, environmental abuse, and David Koch is 15 million in the Smithsonian to create this whitewashing exhibit that has global uh, warming scientists outraged. And this isn't the only, uh, uh, you know, um, Exhibition, I mean, uh, exhibit that um, you know portrays global warming in such a ridiculous light. So Coke funds this. It's a permanent installation. Jane Mayer from the New Yorker writes an article that eviscerates the Cokes and the Smithsonian. And this is an exhibit. This is true. An interactive game in the exhibit suggests that humans will continue to adapt to climate change in the future. People may grill, uh, build underground cities, developing short, compact bodies or curved spines, so that moving around in tight spaces will be no problem. That's a glorious future that the Koch brothers and the Smithsonian have for us. So, you know, the moral of the story is, I'm going to wrap it up now. There were cultures in, this, in, this, uh, in ancient America that lived together, you know, tens of thousands of people in cities. They lived in, in, with connection and love and care and respect for all life forms. And right now, we've mastered fear and separation in our society. And we have organizations and institutions keeping the truth from us and just, you know, telling us to go back to sleep. And, you know, personally, I'm pissed, you know what I mean? I'm sick of it, and I've got to talk to thousands of people, and they agree with my sentiment. You know, enough is enough. Corporations are not people, okay? Corporations do evil stuff all around the globe. We're people. We care. We care about the elderly. We care about children. We care about all life forms. And that's the end of my rant, but I appreciate you listening to it.